Hey, all you listeners out there. In this episode, we talk about Wes Craven's 1989 horror comedy. Nobody's really sure. It's called Shocker. It stars Mitch Pileggi as a executed serial killer who is able to transfer by television to his next murder scene. He fights it out with a college quarterback and his ghost girlfriend. It's uh, Wes Craven's Shocker, and it's not to be missed. John? Yeah, uh, Brian, hi. How's it going? How are you doing today? Uh, I'm okay, John. I'm okay. I was thinking of a movie that I did not like. Hmm. Wow, straight out, the, straight out of the uh, the gate here. Straight out of the tent. It's called Shocker, hmm. 1989. It stars uh, an actor named Mitch Pileggi, who, as far as I know, is most famous for his role in in the X-Files as Cancer Man. Do you remember? Did you watch the X-Files? I did watch the X-Files, but I only remember Scully and Mulder. Yeah, Mulder was visited occasionally by this Cancer Man character who was, I don't remember the details, but he was running all of the mysterious government projects which the X-Files were about, and he sat around and smoked all the time, and Mulder called him Cancer Man. It's that guy. I think that in the X-Files, he was a member of some body of people who made decisions about extraterrestrials and putting chlorine in the water and all sorts of conspiratorially minded government projects. And he, he was trying to kind of be a whistleblower. So that's why he met up with Mulder to sort of leave a trail of breadcrumbs towards the truth for Mulder to follow occasionally. Oh, right. Well, are we talking about X-Files? No, we're still talking about X-Files, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. But this movie is called Shocker, and Mitch Pileggi is Horace Pinker, a technician, a TV repair man, I think, who is also a very prolific serial killer. He terrorizes a town called Maryville, which is home to a university called Midwestern Tech, which has a very good football team. Yeah, this is a movie directed by Wes Craven. We have seen another one of his movies, if you recall, The People Under the Stairs. Yeah, that was a very strange movie. This one, I would say, was even stranger. He's mostly known for A Nightmare on Elm Street. This was a nightmare in, in Maryville. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a nightmare in your living room, I think. It was a nightmare in a lot of places. Oh. He's, he's known as the Maryville Slasher. He's also called the Family Slasher. Throughout the movie, we're treated to shots of John Tesh playing a TV anchor man, giving us updates on the latest. It's like a nightly thing. He butchers a whole family in this town like every <laughs> night, and nobody's like really <laughs> freaking out or moving away. Everybody's totally, I imagine, in a small town. Nightly butchering of a family of four would lead to some protests on the streets or panic or gun purchases, but the town seems relatively resilient <laughs> <laughs> yeah it slides in right after the weather it's uh yeah. how many people have been yeah. murdered last night yeah for whatever reason this uh horace pinker guy is completely elusive to the police he has not mm -hmm. been even seen or discovered or i don't think tell about third of the movie where there's a little sketch of him i think throughout the whole movie maybe maybe not but there's the beginning scene where he's fid where horace is fiddling with tvs and there's all that footage of war and nuclear detonation tests and so on. And I felt like at that point he like shocked himself and then became this, what he is throughout the movie, which is kind of, he, he travels by TV set, right? <laughs> well, this is the, this is what's funny about the movie. And I don't, I don't know if you would call it the uh, movie metaphysics or how one might define the rules that go along with this movie, but uh, there are lots of them. It's like a completely different ecosystem. Within this movie, you might go over the plot line in a very basic way, but there's at least three intersecting pieces. There's Horace Pinker, who somehow, he gets electrocuted on the electric chair. And through that process, he becomes digitized in a sense in which he can interact within the electrical grid, including representation on the TV screen. Early on, Horace Pinker kills Jonathan's girlfriend. So I'll kind of go through the plot line here, but Jonathan is the main lead football star. His girlfriend's killed by Horace Pinker. Also she, his fa foster family, or his, yeah, right? Before well, that. 
Well, I can go into that too. The girlfriend then becomes a ghost at some point who's interacting in the movie. And then you have Jonathan, the main lead, who is you know alive and existing in the real world. So you have the physical real world, you have a, a girlfriend ghost, and then you have electrified serial killer. And at one point, all three of them are interacting and the rules are confusing. But yeah, um, I think that term metaphysics is, is the proper one. Wes Craven is very loose with the metaphysics. Hmm. So let me kind of throw down a plot line here because it is pretty confusing and I hope to get it as close as I can. Jonathan, football star, has a girlfriend. Girlfriend gets killed by Horace Pinker, who has been terrorizing a community. Horace Pinker is then put in an electric chair, not killed, but seemingly becomes symbiotically attached to electricity. Then through the remainder of the movie, Horace Pinker can jump from body to body, sort of um, to puppet those individuals. So he can he can become animated in the world through taking over people's bodies that is done through what seems like touch or electricity. Also not incredibly clear how that works scientifically. And then at the very end of the movie, Jonathan is in a battle with Horace Pinker and somehow defeats him on his own turf, which is quite confusing. Mm -hmm. It seems to include... Jonathan going into the TV, being digitized <laughs> through this process, gets in a physical fight with Horace Pinker, then tricks Horace Pinker to come out of the TV, and Jonathan's football friends <laughs> shut off the electricity <laughs> to the entire city or town, and, and that somehow traps Horace Pinker outside of the TV or electric field environment, and then Jonathan jumps into a TV camera, but it has to be draped by this necklace, which I haven't explained, which is this sort of talisman. Is that the correct term? Talisman, yeah. This, this sort of um, symbolic jewelry that has special powers that he drapes on the lens of the camera. So Jonathan jumps into the TV with this necklace draping the camera, and then the camera explodes or something, and then Horace Pinker is, becomes objectified in the real world, and then he can be slain. Is that close? I, I don't remember all the details, but that's what yeah. I recollect. I was baffled by the last half hour of the movie trying to figure out all those mechanics. I ultimately gave up trying to understand exactly when Pinker would be killed, under what circumstances his digitized electrical spirit would be. Because that didn't even kill him, right? Remember at the very end when the football team knocks out the power, Pinker is still alive and threatening Jonathan in the fires of the sparking blown out television set it's only when jonathan then uses his remote control to turn <laughs> off and then and then blows out it like a gun that that presumably pinker is finally yeah so even even the power didn't kill him it's the that's right remote they got I, I forgot about that scene where he's <laughs> throwing pinker around uh, yeah. through the through so the yeah, power no. of the remote control yeah there's a, there's some kind of anti you know, turn off your TV and experience life manifesto in this movie, which maybe we can talk about later. But yeah, it was this weird mix, like you said, of ghost girlfriend and spiritualism and medium mediums and demonisms and dream states versus waking states. And then this whole thing about electricity being the means by which he travels. And yeah, yeah it was just a very strange movie. A lot of uh, water symbolism being in the water or him falling into the waterbed or I'm yeah. assuming it's a representation of the dream state or subconscious or something like that. Yeah, but running parallel to all that is this weird slapstick comedy element. And there's all these verbal puns and all of Pinker's dialogue is like just little schoolyard <laughs> antic kind of insults. And then the, the whole football team thing is just like this element of like... And even the actor who played Jonathan is just this element of like bro teamwork and everybody's cheering for each other. This is very strange <laughs> ingredients throughout this whole movie. It's like comedy, but also this kind of typical 80s or 90s victory movie where the team defeats the villain. And I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's very, it, you, you'd think a movie with demons and ghosts and digitized serial killers would have a certain feel to it, a feel of scariness or anything, but it, there's none of that to me, at least. Yeah, I didn't find it 
particularly terrifying. I, I felt that the murder scenes or the who is who as Pinker jumps body to body, almost, uh, yeah, almost like just trying, like it just kind of tried me. It was, it was just kind of fatiguing to watch that process because I just didn't really care about that feature. And it was kind of goofy, but it didn't further the plot. So whether he jumped to one body or he jumped to 12 bodies, by the 12th body, it didn't, it, it had just the same effect as the first body. So, all right, that's a cool little mechanic maybe, but but the repetition of it didn't add anything, at least to me. The whole start of this for Jonathan, however, is when he suffers a concussion on the playing field. Mm, that's right. And this is where the first kind of jokey elements of the movie got in. He's He's on the field with his team practicing and his coach is this traditional 80s coach just yelling about <laughs> his focus and saying all these quotable things about motivation and focus and greatness and all this sort of stuff and jonathan is a very good athlete but he's distracted by a girl on the sidelines and the viewer is presented with the idea that he's just a ladies man and can't focus when there's a woman around but it turns out that that's his lovely and they have a long-term relationship allison girlfriend but um yeah he gets distracted by something i don't remember and he's like catching a touchdown he runs into the field goal pole that's when he has at first it's a dream so it's not about tv or electricity yet it's about a dream and he during the night has this very vivid dream where he's present during the murder of his mm. foster family mm -hmm. the wife the wife of his foster dad and the two other foster children that they've adopted are murdered in a separate house and he wakes up and says, oh, it was just a dream, I think. I think that's what he says. But then it's on the news, and his dad obviously directs the investigation of the crime scene. His dad is a, is the head of the police force. Okay, so let's, let's take a break here and just kind of review the metaphysics involved in this movie so far. So Jonathan has a concussion. After the concussion, he does have some, what seems like some visual experiences where he sees kids on the street. And he's obviously, as you said, projected into a murder scene. So there's a a gift or a feature that he's given that allows him to travel time and space and experience things that are happening, I guess, in parallel, in time parallel. So it's not that he's going into the future or going into the past. It's within the same time construct, but he's able to view things outside of having to be present, almost like a, an extrasensory experience, to maybe telescoping into a new space. Does that sound about right? I do think that it was pre-murders that he had the dream. I don't remember I, for sure, and I'm not sure if it's important given all the all the other loose ends that this movie has about cause and effect. But I, I felt like when he was talking to his dad, when he was talking to Donnie, the mm -hmm. head of the police force, he said something like, I saw the murders. It was before they happened. And then maybe he was feeling regret that he didn't get over there fast enough to stop it or something like mm, that. So it is a, he can see into the future for a bit. It's not that it's well, just happening. Yeah. In and later he definitely can because he, I forget exactly mm, the scene, mm -hmm. but he, he somehow sets up Pinker at an, at another murder scene, uh, tries to get him and fails. But I don't remember exactly. That's right. And he could, he could see the house number and know where the crime is going to take place. Yeah. Now, as, as far as the lineage here, cause I think that's important. There's a theme here that I want to highlight. I believe that Jonathan's dad is Horace Pinker. I think that's a implied yeah. connection there. He says that in the execution chamber when he's strapped into the chair, he Jonathan is there as one of the witnesses behind the glass, and Pinker says something about him being a chip off the old block and yeah, mm -hmm. suggesting he and then at the end of the movie, when he's got him on pause, <laughs> uh Pinker says that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so there's a there's a there's an overarching theme here which I'll highlight now. Horace Pinker seems to be the personification of violent television. And maybe mm -hmm. this is an MTV generation concern, but that Horace Pinker is this entity that through seeing it, being exposed to it, Jonathan would be exposed to Horace Pinker. There's a becoming of violence. And Jonathan is in this choice-driven process through the movie where He's like, well, is this my dad? Is this my destiny? Is violent television my 
influence that I have no control over and I will become a violent person because of the exposure to it or this maybe um, a genetic consideration. There does seem to be this destiny of genetics and environment. And I think that Horace Pinker is supposed to be violent TV that's in your kid's living room and is influencing them. And they have the choice or maybe not the choice to become violent and influenced by this television experience or not. I don't yeah, know if you got that feel. I, I got a larger anti-television manifesto feel. Mm, like mm -hmm. a lot of the scenes, you're right, were violent, like war documentary war footage and atomic bomb testing blasts. And But then there's other, when, especially at the end when Pinker and Jonathan are wrestling each other through all the TV channels, there's one part where they're in like an Alice Cooper video, which I guess involved uh, strangling someone on stage. But then there's nonviolent uh, backdrops too, where they are on the John Tesh news program, <laughs> body slamming each other. And then they bounce out of, of a TV into a sort of a, a cluttered, seemingly poor family where the father is looking for the cheese spread. And then Horace Pinker and Jonathan are wrestling. And I think, Jonathan grabs the remote and the lady's got hair curls on. And yeah, I think it's a larger sort of TV ruins your family dynamic. TV present prevents real human connection. And then at the end, when all the power goes out, all the neighbors come out and notice how beautiful the sky is because mm. they can't watch the TV. So I think there, there's definitely mm. TV presents violence. And maybe that's the I'm your dad message. But then there's this larger thing of like, we're missing out on the beauty of actual nature and and human connection because we all are are all dialed into our i love it brian so it's like <laughs> horse horse pinker is the serial killer of your life essentially he's tv and horse pinker is coming into your life every day as you consume horse pinker also known as tv and then that is killing you in a sense well, and you're not then, even experiencing your life what do you do then with the horse pinker is the actual father of jonathan hints then right and this is where the the idea of i think choice comes in where if i'm exposed to tv do i become it or do i have a choice outside of it i don't think that's satisfying enough i do think that there's a a loose connection there i don't know if that what the intention is is that i can choose my own destiny even if my dad is a serial killer i can not become a serial killer even if there's tv in my house that is has a negative message or a violent message, that doesn't mean that I then become a violent person. I don't know if that's the association that's being made here. Yeah, definitely. Later in the movie at the end where he's got Pinker on pause and he has the opportunity to, I think, to stab him with a piece of glass or something. And Pinker's like egging him on and he says, no, that's not my style. So even at that moment where he's trying to destroy Pinker, he won't do it in a murderous fashion mm -hmm. that i don't know yeah there there's um i i see what you're saying about horace pinker being violent television and it's it's influences i mean that's clearly a sub a theme of this movie that i feel is pretty the anti-tv manifesto in in broader terms is is how the movie ends and i think for me it's the main message of the movie Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what, what was happening in 1989 in terms of pop culture and attitudes towards TV, but I see it as the main takeaway from the movie thematically. Right. Yeah. That's, I kind of see that too. And maybe that's completely obvious and we're highlighting something that uh, is unnecessary to highlight, but yeah, <laughs> it, uh, it def there's a thematic piece there. And then there's the, this is a, maybe a little lighter is there's the death of, Jonathan's girlfriend, which appears to disrupt his entire future, the sort of loss of paradise, disruption of potential, death of innocence when the serial killer comes in and kills Jonathan's girlfriend. That's just a kind of more of a traditional plot element that maybe isn't attached to watching TV, but. Yeah, they were talking about starting a family already. But when, I, when the movie first started, like on the football field scene, I thought it was high school. And so, you know, two kids dating, fine. But then she's like, they're talking about having kids and all this sort of stuff. And then later on, we're told that 
he's a junior in college, so a little more age appropriate. Yeah, because they were living together at that point, and I was kind of surprised myself. Oh, really? I, did, I thought, uh, okay, yeah. It seemed like they were living together. Yeah, I guess. He well, she whole, was spending the night a lot, let's just say that. Her character was very strange because she gets murdered, and for her birthday, Jonathan had given her a little heart necklace, which, like you said, later on becomes this talisman that Pinker just can't stand. I don't understand. <laughs> if, if if Pinker is violent television, what do we do then with the revulsion that he and the physical suffering that he feels in the presence of the heart locket? Okay. Yeah. But let me yeah continue with sure. with the Allison. Like yeah, like you said, she dies and then she becomes this ghost that visits Jonathan at key moments in the plot to to help him and support him and and so on. But then at the end of the movie. She says to him, like, you'll never be alone again. And when he when he's got the power turned off and steps outside and notices how nice the sky is, she whispers something in his ear. And so you're left with the idea that this ghost is going to sort of perpetually haunt in a good way, Jonathan, for the rest of his life. And just this very weird, good demon, but demonic element to the whole thing, which that's my question for you is if Horace Pinker is violent television or. Or just the evils of television in general, what does the relationship symbolizing heart locket symbolize in mm. terms of anti-TV, if anything? <laughs> there is a certain concrete nature to a physical object, such like a locket, and that suggests it's enduring. So maybe there's this love will last forever type experience that no matter your girlfriend getting killed by a, a mass murderer. No, no need to worry for, uh, she'll always be in your heart. Yeah. And it, it represents a real authentic human relationship and TV prevents such authentic relationships. So it makes sense that TV would be repelled by its presence. Hmm. Mm -hmm. She also just sort of coaches Jonathan in these moments of her visitations to be the person that he wants to be. You don't really get the feeling like Jonathan is tugged towards evil tendencies. There's one scene where he wants to stay in the lake with <laughs> Allison and just be a ghost and I guess get killed. And she, she coaches him to go back and finish off Pinker. But I didn't get the image that Jonathan is pulled in, in a, in a violent direction or, or in a, or in a, my life is over because Allison's dead. I'll give up on football. I'll give up on college. You don't, I, I didn't get that impression. So yeah, Allison's there in ghost form to like coach him to defeating Pinker, but otherwise, and the actual football coach as well gives him some motivation, some in, uh, yeah. So there's, it's all about defeating Pinker. It's not about becoming violent necessarily or giving up on life because Allison is dead or anything like that. Mm. In that scene where he's in the water, just to give the absurdity of the movie, is he's in a dream at that point. So Jonathan's in a dream, dreaming of his dead girlfriend who's talking to him beyond the grave. And then he wakes up and has to jump into the TV to defeat Horse Pinker. This is the environment in which the movie is operating <laughs> and what we have to accept as to the, the framework and the landscape of what's the possibility within this. There's a nice little spiritual element or a kind of bringing you out of the concrete nature of, of life, but the rules do get a little undefined as to what is possible and what isn't possible. I think that there's a little piece here that might give some reason to some of these elements. Wes Craven, he did Last House on the Left. That was his 1972 picture. We haven't seen that yet. We'll see it at some point. Then he did Nightmare on Elm Street. We're going to watch that pretty soon. But with Nightmare on Elm Street, that's where he got a lot of his credibility. That series continued on through a different production company, and he lost the rights to for him to, I don't know, keep that as an intellectual property or something like that. There's some distance between his ability to continue to do Nightmare on Elm Street, and he lost that as a, a thing that he had creative control over. This movie, Shocker, has lots of elements that Nightmare on Elm Street had. It appears that he created this to get a foothold 
into the horror genre on a different train, essentially. So there, there's elements that are quite similar. So there's a overall perspective that youths can see things and understand things that parents don't. That's an element that's in both of these pictures. There is a kind of a half in and half out of a waking state or a dream state. So there's a separation between reality and the unconscious or a separate reality being a dream state, which also kind of parallels in this movie. There is this idea of a necklace or physical object that can be pulled and used as a weapon between the dream state and the waking state. And so that plays the same role as the necklace. So there's some parallels here that maybe are artifacts that he's incorporating into this movie that he maybe saw as essential elements that made Nightmare on Elm Street successful. And so he's incorporating that, but they may not be compatible with the narrative that he's also trying to create outside of that picture. So I think he's trying to mishmash these things together in the hopes that through this stew of elements that he'll have another successful franchise in Shocker. I haven't seen the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, although I look forward to seeing them. But I do know that Freddy Krueger can only get you when you're dreaming, right? That's why everybody tries to not sleep. Right. And so not to give anything away, but there is an element of getting him out of the dream state in order to conquer him. And mm. that is where this parallels with Shocker, where they're trying to get him out of the power grid. And then once he's out of the power grid, you can, I don't know, throw a net over him or control him with your remote and then defeat him. Some elements that are drawn in from a previous movie that may not be compatible with Shocker's own narrative. I, I mentioned the dialogue. I found the dialogue absurd. Just all, there were so many insults shouted and silly things said during high tension face offs, even between Jonathan and, and Donnie, his dad. There's just all this weird dialogue. And yeah, that's not a, anything very productive <laughs> it's just an experience i had throughout the movie the, it, even the actor like jonathan's whole every line was delivered you know with with cheekbones and with jaw clenching and within the same tone and the same kind of way of finishing every sentence with like a lip smack and a, and a jaw clench and then the coach was just outrageous just always coaching no matter what he was saying it was it was <laughs> screaming on the football field even when he was in the house fighting out the spirit of of pinker inside of him it was like uh, just yelled in in the manner of a coach exhorting a field full of of college football players and i don't know just the the tone of all the characters was like disruptive to the uh, to the whole any creation of tension or yeah i just giggled throughout throughout basically most of the dialogue it was either terribly written or over the top delivered or poorly delivered or I don't know. It's a lot of complaints, but the coach was still wearing his uh, coaching outfit, even uh, even <laughs> off the field and, <laughs> in uh, Jonathan's apartment. He's still wearing it. And the, uh, the whole the whole team was great. They were like totally into going to this power station. Like, yeah, let's go do it. They're like high fiving on the way there. <laughs> and how would how, how would they know to uh, shut down a power grid and what box um, to go to and picking uh, a lock? Rhino had a, I believe he had a blueprint of some kind that he oh, right. guided him <laughs> to the to the thing and then the whole thing where there's one point where pinker is inhabiting a construction worker this is after he leaps into a cop and then a little girl and then the little girl's mom and then the construction worker is the final this is all happening in a public park mm -hmm. where jonathan is successively wrestling with these various passers-by but then pinker winds up in a construction worker's body and the construction worker flings the magic heart amulet into a lake. And later on, I'm just highlighting some of, I just don't understand why that part in particular was so absurd. He, he is in a, in a pep talk with coach and the football team. And he says, I can get the, I can get the, the amulet out of the lake. I just need my diving mask. And so coach volunteers to go to Jonathan's house to get the diving mask. But then of course, Pinker is there and kills coach in the shower for some reason. So, but then he, He's with Rhino, his his fellow football teammate at the lake, 
And he proposes to go in and he actually goes in like waist deep with Rhino following him, trying to stop him. He proposes to just go in without the mask, which he suddenly doesn't need. He doesn't need his diving mask to find the amulet anymore. But it's midnight. It's like the middle of the night because this is this, the, it's pitch black dark. And he proposes to go and find this amulet. And then later on, I forget if it's a dream scene or whatever, but he's back at the lake and he's he finds it. And then that's when Allison shows up from under the waves. But he he. I, there's just like a lot of head scratching elements like that combined with the hilariously delivered dialogue and just over the top characters. I don't know. It, uh, it was a perfect cocktail for you. So what you're trying to tell me? Well, so the dream it, state <laughs> is when he got the amulet. So I agree all that unnecessary section, much like there isn't a need for Pinker to go to 10 different bodies <laughs> just as much as there isn't a need for him to wrestle around on how to get this amulet back. And at the end or near the end, he does get it back, but through this dream state. So he goes to bed, which you don't know at first because it's all this kind of blue midnight tone. And you think he's out there in the fog, but it cuts to him sleeping where Pinker is looking at him through the TV. So Jonathan's asleep, retrieving an amulet in a dream state as his dead girlfriend ghost is directing him on how to get it, he comes out of the dream state and he's somehow possessed this necklace. Then Pinker is looking at him through the TV. And then at some point he jumps into the TV. He really pushes the envelope where it comes to, okay, well, is this a, a dream state? Is this a waking state? Is this in the TV? Is this, is this guy in the electricity? My girlfriend comes, she's a ghost. What dimension is she coming from? And it just gets a little bit too, or maybe not to, depending on your interests, without grounding in reality or physical state. I wrote down psychedelic while I was watching it. The whole, especially when they're jumping from TV program to TV program, that had a very psychedelic feel to me. On the positive side, the movie was very creative. It had a Cronenberg feel to me, like leaping from, from TV to electricity to reality felt Cronenbergish to me. But the whole scene where they're leaping from channel to channel and then out of reality and then back into the tv and pausing pinker and all that is it made no sense but i thought it was it was a psychedelic fun sort of feel and but then yeah the the there's one part where pinker materializes as the lounge chair <laughs> and grabs grab grabs uh jonathan so, something out of peewee's playhouse <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the first, I believe, the first non-human physical manifestation of Pinker. Or, or am I mm, wrong about that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it was. It was just. Uh, I mean, I was laughing out loud, but at the same time, that was probably the most creepy moment for me. Was when the Barker lounger grabbed him and had eyeballs on him. Was there an eye roll on your side of the TV? No. Well, there was at other times. There's a lot of head scratching on my side of the TV for sure. Did you ever enter into the TV? At any moment, when you know, I'm not sure. I, I fell asleep at one point, and then mm. I woke up in a lake. And right, that was your yeah. own urine, though. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that came to mind is there's a mental status exam that one does during an assessment. One of the questions is around one's ability to ground themselves in time and place, and there's a fascinating element as to how consistent or how comfortable people might be in their time and state, despite their memory or ability to sense things, you know, your, your vision is only so strong or so precise, you could say. When you fall asleep, you know, you have dreams that are almost psychotic in nature. Mm -hmm. Then you wake up and then you're like, what day is it? And then the, the weekends come and, you know, so this movie really gets into the really upends the what's real, what isn't real, what's unconscious, what's conscious, what's waking state, what's sleeping state, and the consistency that people push through their lives and the confidence that they may or may not have as to what they're experiencing is true is a, is a kind of an interesting feature. I, I think that pe people are pretty, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but I think people are surprisingly confident in what they're experiencing are true and accurate and their comfort in time and place, despite lots of situations in which that continuity is upended. And not, not substantially, but I, there's things in my memory that I, things in, in my past I don't remember clearly, 
there are sometimes I meet someone and I'm like, have I met this person before? And, you know, not necessarily totally not sure what day it is or what time it is, but there's some flexibility to my, or looseness maybe to my not knowing what day it might be at any given point in time. The work week helps with that, but I don't think I'm outside the norm when it comes to these variables, but this kind of movie pushes into the flexibility that could be allowed within someone's experience. And maybe there's a reflection on how comfortable people are despite evidence that things may not be as true as they might appear. So you're saying that Pinker is the one who shows an impressive ability to ground himself in time and space or Jonathan is you're talking about Jonathan, I think. Yeah. I'm sort of talking about it in general, the, the looseness or the flexibility that the, the movie provides between these three different states, whether it being in the TV or in a dream state or in a, a waking state, the fluidity between these three different states, and then sort of thinking about one's own experience and how confident they may be in what appears to be somewhat unreliable senses. And so I don't really have a point to it other than an observation. Yeah, I'm trying to build off that. I think that there's something about dreaming in particular where your body is paralyzed and you're lying flat and you you wake up and you're not actually falling from the sky or you're not actually making love or you're not actually filled with stab wounds. So there's a lack of physical evidence of the imagined dream events. Whereas during the daytime, if you were doing those things, there would be physical consequences. Mm -hmm. So the, the mind must have some fundamental ability to discard those mental states experienced while dreaming, whether it's, it's obviously not something the mind thinks of and says, Oh, that's a dream. So I'll, I'll, I'll build my sense of self around these daytime events, but there's some kind of ability of our self making to not include those dream elements for whatever reason it must be automated. Right. There's a, almost a preference to not include them because if I include them, then what would that say about the rest of my world? Like if things become quite loose and I think, wow, that is quite unusual in order for me to accept this as true, that would mean everything up until this point would possibly be untrue. And so there's a, a weight of preference to then discard some event that feels a little unusual as a misinterpretation or a misunderstanding as opposed to it being accurate. Because if that's accurate, then it could upend my whole psychology in a sense. And those memories of dreams are so fleeting as well. I don't know if that's a part of the mechanism involved with not incorporating them into our narratives of self, unless I make a particular point to remember a dream or write down one that was cool or something to remember later. I never remember them. I, I walk around with a corpus of memories about my daytime experiences, but I don't walk around with a corresponding body of dream memories mm -hmm. and maybe that that's either a cause or a consequence of this move my brain does to not weave those dream experiences into my creation of a sense of self mm. there's like maybe a an element that you attach to your dreams that classify it differently than self-experience yeah. although i i do have a few dreams that i've experienced that if reflection of, I can't remember if they actually happened or not. Nothing particularly amazing. It's just sort of like, yeah, I, I remember that. Was that a dream that that happened or did that actually happen? I've also had experiences in dreams where I've experienced things that are emotionally richer than I've experienced in real life. I remember a dream I had where I was floating down a river in an inner tube and there was a peacefulness to it, a, a bliss, and uh, a sense of awe that, almost a childlike awe. And I remember having that and waking up and being like, wow, that was, a, that was a richness of emotional experience that I've never had in an actual experience. 
uh, it almost feels like, okay, well, does that mean that there's a blunting in my real life or was that the imagined life or the dream life afforded intersections of situations and emotions that that just hasn't happened yet or is beyond the capacity of it ever happening just because it's so uniquely more powerful maybe in certain ways than, than could ever actually be experienced. Yeah. Maybe that's part of the reason why people try to interpret dreams or, or just more broadly view dreams as a truer manifestation of self than during our waking states. Like you said, where our emotions are and our, and our actions too are uninhibited and, and, physical reality is sometimes the rules of physical reality are sometimes suspended. So there's this inviting idea that the, the true sort of unchained unbound me is the one in the dreams. And my dreams might be some kind of coded message from that true me to the chained restrained daytime me, which, which wouldn't my self be more fully manifested in all states, if I was more like the me of my dream states, there's 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 that idea that you know we we need to interpret our dreams and our dreams have messages for us. So maybe that idea is a function of the emotional. Yeah, I've I have had the same experience: feelings of sexual pleasure and feelings of uh, love, uh, non sexual love, and feelings of fear mm -hmm. at at higher at higher pitches during dreams than I've ever had, especially fear during during my waking life there must be that capacity in my nervous system to reach that pitch of feeling, but I've only, as far as I can remember, only ever felt it during sleeping states. So like the, the ingredients are in there just waiting to be combined. They just haven't been combined during my waking hours to the same intensity of flavor as they have during my sleeping hours. So there's something there for sure. Yeah, well, shocker. I just had one final note. He, there's a fight on the top of a satellite dish. <laughs> yeah, that, and, yeah. yeah, and Pinker gloats as he evaporates out of Donnie, the foster dad, into the now visible beam that is being broadcast out of the satellite dish. He's Pinker says something like, "I'm nationwide now. I'm I'm now nationwide," and and then he's gone and Donnie, the foster father is restored and everybody comes down off the satellite dish. But then all the killings for the rest of the movie remain in Maryville. There's no nationwide. <laughs> that's when he's, that's when Pinker starts leaping from channel to channel and, and people start calling into John Tesh's news show and saying, I just saw Horace Pinker in my, you know, on my, on my nature program. And so that, that seems to that seems to be the mechanism that allows him to jump from channel to channel, but you don't, you don't get the impression that he's that he's truly wreaking havoc on families across the nation. He's still in Maryville. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another another electric form that he takes. Which I'd be curious if there is an a uh, electric. What was it? Someone who studies uh, electrician. Well, I'm thinking more like an electrophysicist. Is that a thing? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, who would be able to explain if it would be possible to both convert into electricity and into a broadcast signal. But I think that that's a mechanic to suggest shocker two might be oh. on the horizon. You see what I'm saying? He's, I think, it, I think did, he's did, did, did shocker two seeding himself. Um, no, not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. I think, I think it's just sort of like that gives the shoe in to him being shocker coming out and in, in a TV someplace else, almost yeah. like a, a, the ring in a sense. Yeah. And despite the ending where, Jonathan triumphantly blows the smoke off of his 1989 remote control. I didn't have a sense of closure. I didn't get the feeling like Pinker was really dead. I think the door's open. Maybe if, if any of our listeners know the mechanics of mm. electricity versus satellite transmissions or <laughs> anything like that, maybe, maybe they can enlighten us. I don't know. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to know that. Oh, man. Jeez. Wow. What a, what a movie, you know? Have you seen something similar as this where I, there's a, a ghost doing battle with uh, someone who manifests themselves in a TV? Not that I can remember. Not that it's, I can remember. Okay. it's a unique movie for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, Wes Craven.
Yeah, well, then that's good. Yeah. You really knocked it out of the park with this one. Although, maybe, apparently, once I see Freddy Krueger movies, I'm going to be, it's not going to feel so unique, maybe. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We haven't quite stepped into that yet, so. Yeah, there's plenty to step in. <laughs> uh, all right, well, I'm just going to turn on this transistor radio and see what oh, the weather's like. I don't think that any electronics are called for, John. Let's just look up at the night sky and have a nice fire. Okay, fair enough. <laughs>